Okay, we're getting ready to read um, chapter 15 of Cracker, The Best Dog in Vietnam by Cynthia Katahata. Um, yesterday, or earlier today, rather, when we finished reading chapter 14, um, you know that um, Cracker and Rick had just led um, an entire platoon of 150 men through, um, they had been ambushed, and they avoided several traps. One of the last ones that they talked about was um, a Punji pit. And you remember um, I showed you earlier an example of what a Punji pit was. And here's one that's on the video. Um, there are all kinds of varieties of this, but this is just the most basic. And it seems like the one that was described in the story, these stakes that I'm showing you here on the screen, they were also driven into the side. And if you remember, one of the things that the VC would do was to put um, feces on the tips of these sharpened bamboo sticks so that not only would the soldier be injured, but they would also be infected. Um, we talked about um, the leeches that they had um, gotten on their bodies from where they had to crawl through the rice paddies while they had their selves undercover from the sniper fire um, and the way that they got the leeches off was there were several things that they could do, but one of the things they could either stick a lit cigarette to them and make them let go or Rick used um, the leech repellent, they call it bug juice, and put some on his finger and touched it to the leech and it caused the leech to release its hold on him and Cracker and to him it seemed like the most dangerous or least dangerous way to do it. Um, and remember the guys had to be careful and not just pull the leech, leeches off because their jaws would stay lodged in your skin and could cause infection. Um, one of the interesting things that we talked about previously was when Rick had gotten to um, the area where they set up the barracks, they didn't actually have barracks. They had to live in tents for a while. But one of the things that they did in Vietnam is they used sandbags. You guys see sandbags a lot in the news when there's flooding or things like that around. They use them and fill them literally with sand to create a barrier to hold back water. But Rick was talking about his, that he was having to fill up weren't um, actually being filled with sand. They were actually being filled with dirt. But what they used, like this gentleman you see, and this is an actual Vietnam era picture, um, they would use them as barricades. So they would line them up so high around um, the areas where they had the temporary barracks set up to protect them and give them some type of barricade to hide behind in case they came under fire because the thickness and the dirt would absorb the bullets and protect them from the bullets where the thin um, wooden tarpaulin uh, structures that they had to live in, tents sometimes provided little or no protection from the bullets. Another thing that we talked about was he talked about the hooches that they lived in and the hooches that um, the Vietnamese lived in. Um, there's all kinds of different examples. They were basically dwelling structures that um, were made out of whatever was at hand. Of course, the GIs, they made it out of the tarpaulins, the tents, and the wood. And um, the indigenous people, the Vietnamese, they made it out of whatever was at hand. But here's an example of one, and it looks like it's got um, tarpaulins over the top of it, like tent material. Um, but I wanted to draw your attention to, they're built up off the ground because you know that Vietnam um, is an area where there's a rainy season. So they have a wet season and they have a dry season and they have to be up off the ground because a lot of the areas that they live in are below the, the floodplain. And so it could be, um, if the rains would start, you know, before you know it, you could be... Um, have your home and your things underwater. So they tend to build them up off the ground and there's space underneath the homes, the hooches that they call them. But um, one of the things that Rick talked about Cracker, his dog alerting, alerting on was the chickens and they kept the lives, the chickens up under in the space up underneath the hooches and they would put fencing up around it and keep the chickens under there. And that's one of the things that they did. So I wanted to show that to you so that you could see a little bit of what we were talking about there. All right, so let's get on with reading chapter 15.
Cracker ran fast as she could. Her muscles got, had gotten stronger every day, and she loved the feel, her power, as she pushed off the ground to gallop. If she got caught, there'd be a lot of trouble. So despite a nearly overwhelming desire, she didn't stop to eat the steak she had clenched in her jaws. She ran as fast as she could. Tristy raced by her side, and a few other dogs ran behind them. The calls of the men grew farther and farther away. She spotted a row of tall cans in front of her, smelled like gas cans. Right before she reached the cans, she pushed up on her back legs as hard as she could and felt herself soar into the air. But she never forgot to keep her mouth clamped. She knew she would make it. She cleared the cans by such a small amount that her back paws brushed them as she landed. She stopped for one second and swallowed the steak. By the time the other dogs reached her, the steak was gone. She could hear yelling in the background. The noisy man yelled loudest of all. She hung her head low as the noisy man and all the other men ran around the cans. They smelled of sweat. Rick marched up to her. She hung her head even lower and whined. She lifted her eyes lovingly and pawed at Rick before Rick could say a word. The noisy man spoke up. That was your dinner, mister. I told you guys to keep those dogs on leash. In the short time Cracker had been there, she noticed a change in the way Rick treated the noisy man. Rick was a lot more casual with him. Now he said, "Uh uh-huh, sergeant all the while glaring at Cracker. Twenty had managed to procure some steak by trading a pile of choice magazines he'd obtained from somewhere. Who knew where he got the stuff he traded? That was one of his specialties. Twenty had specialties, focuses. No generalist there. The men pulled the dogs by their collars into the kennels. Rick pushed Cracker in and said, Bad girl, I'll see you tomorrow. No supper. He walked off. Cracker looked around. Every dog was staring at her. She regurgitated the steak and sniffed at it. Mm, smelled good, very good. Then she swallowed it again and lay in the same place where the setting sun slanted over the grated side of her kennel. She watched Rick's back retreat into the distance. She liked steak, very, very good. She closed her eyes and let the sun warm her face. Every day was pretty good. Sometimes Rick took her out to work. The days were mostly dry. The temperatures were pleasant in the mornings and evenings. But when she worked in the afternoons, she got hot. Whenever she tried to drink from any place except Rick's steel pot or her bowl, he got mad at her. Right now, she lapped up water from her bowl before lying in the sun again to fall asleep. The next morning, Rick showed up as usual with her breakfast. He fed her sullenly and left. She whimpered, and he turned around. She gave him a look of love. It's not funny, he said. The whole unit got steak for dinner last night. And I got sea rats. Sea rats. Mmm, good. Rick looked at her sternly, but she just wagged her tail. And then he cracked a smile and said, Okay, let's go. They spent the day with some other guys and dogs, jumping all over the walls and through tunnels at the obstacle course. The men had erected for the dogs to do what Cracker thought of as play acting. It was fun, but not as intense as when they got out to work for real. The guys laughed more, and Cracker couldn't feel much tension except maybe a certain competitiveness among Rick and his friends. She tried to do everything he said really well. Still, she knew these days were just pretend. Once she raced ahead of Rick without any command from him and did the whole obstacle course, then she ran up to him and sat. She waited for his reaction and got what she wanted, a smile, a good girl. Cracker loved playing, and every time she worked for real, more and more guys petted her and gave her food. Sometimes she could tell this annoyed Rick. He would say, I'm her handler, which Cracker took to mean that he felt jealous. So then she would sit next to him and lick his hand to let him know she understood. But she still liked the treats. During the evenings, Rick would brush her and tell her she was the best dog in Nam. She would hear the exact same words coming from the mouths of Cody and Twenty as they brushed their dogs. She didn't know what the words meant, but she took them to mean good dog. Sometimes, even on slow days, something would happen that would remind Rick that men were dying out there. Like once he saw some guys gathered around a radio man. Rick heard shouting and screaming. The shouting, he realized, had come over the radio and from a different unit. He heard a man scream in pain. He looked around him. Here in his little section of the war, everything was peaceful. He was hearing someone over the radio screaming, maybe dying. He listened soberly to the sounds of battle. He heard the screaming die out, and he wondered whether that meant the soldier was better or worse. 
over the next few weeks, Rick pulled some routine missions, or maybe Cracker was such a good dog that she made everything go smoothly. They cleared a couple of villages where Cracker found some ammo and VC food caches. They set up a few ambushes during which the most exciting thing that happened was that Rick got so many mosquito bites, it looked like he had a rash on his arms. Clearing villages was pretty routine. You just emptied the village of humans and animals and took your dog through looking for weapons and food caches. The first time was hard because Cracker got real interested in the chickens and other animals that the villagers kept, and Rick couldn't keep her focused. She didn't seem to understand that she wasn't supposed to chase small animals. Rick remembered how much she drooled when she'd seen the chicken at Fort Benning. Still, he felt he'd been able to control her pretty well here in the country. Some of the dogs were even worse. Every time they'd cleared a village here in, in Vietnam, she'd managed to find a few tunnels, but none of them seemed like VC tunnels. They were just the same old tunnels all the villagers dug to hide out whenever the need arose. Nearly all the homes had double walls or secret tunnels. There were American soldiers, they were what American soldiers called tunnel rats, who specialized in exploring the more elaborate tunnels when they could find them. Charlie had dug an elaborate system of tunnels throughout some areas of Vietnam. Nobody was sure exactly how elaborate the tunnels were, but it was rumored that thousands of people, even kids, lived underground. They slept, cooked dinner, went to school, planted tacks, all in tunnels. Some of them didn't see daylight for months at a time, and some came out only at night to stage ambushes or even to work at the rice paddies. All this was utterly amazing to Rick. One guy in his neighborhood back home had built a bomb shelter in his backyard and had actually tried, tried it out for a week. Rick's grandmother had said the guy was nutty as popcorn. Rick smiled as he remembered thinking that nutty as popcorn made no sense at all. Kind of like 20s for all intensive purposes. The memory made him ache for home, even for working in the hardware store. It was hard for Rick to imagine living in a bomb shelter for a week, let alone a tunnel for several months. He couldn't imagine Cracker doing it either. It would probably drive her insane. One day, when things were especially quiet, one of the cooks declared that he could heat up an entire mess hall's worth of food in five minutes. Watch this, said Cook. I'm going to revolutionize this army. Rick and Cody hung around for the show. The cook took a 32-gallon galvanized trash can and set it on three big food cans. He filled the big trash can with hot water and placed a stick of C4 explosive under the can and lit it. It burned the very hot and intense orange flame. Cody was the optimist, and he said, Hey, this might really work. As the water boiled, the can started to shake violently. It's going to blow, shouted Rick. He and the other guys took off and hit the dirt about 20 yards away, turning to watch the shaking can fall off its perch. The whole thing exploded, sending the can, food, and water in all directions. A captain appeared about 30 seconds later to chew out the cook. Every fly from Three Corps already seemed to be invading the area. The captain glared at all the men, who were now at attention. None of you will be eating lunch today unless you care to partake in that food with the flies. Rick wanted to protest. When something like that was going on, of course, you were going to watch. But he wasn't about to argue with the captain. Even Cracker heard the explosion from her kennel. She could tell it was nearby, and she felt a surge of worry about Rick. She didn't see him again until the evening, when he came to take her for a walk. He seemed to re so relaxed and happy. And that was good. The very next morning, he showed up tense and worried. That was bad. He quickly fed her, hardly petted her at all. He didn't seem to be mad at her, though, just distracted. I'll be back after breakfast, he said. We pulled a special miss mission. He hesitated and then walked back to the kennel, opened Cracker's gate, and laid his forehead on hers. She liked that. She stood still as she possibly could so she could concentrate on what he was feeling. He was worried. He pulled back. You remember what a hot zone is, Crack? He rubbed behind her ears. He asked for us specifically. He lowered his voice. It's a secret mission. I don't even know what it is. Manning, Wisconsin had not prepared Rick for this. His whole future had been laid out before him there. Not many surprises. Cracker sniffed his pocket. Hot dog. Rick pulled it out and heaved her a piece. Got this from the chef. She gobbled it up. I don't know how you stay so skinny. He closed the gate and she saw him heave a piece of hot dog at Bruno. Hey, that wasn't right. Oh, well. She sat by the gate and waited. He always came back a little while after he fed her. They were probably going to work today. She could tell by how tense he was. 
Before Rick returned, she stood up and pushed the tip of her nose through the chain link. She knew he was coming because, well, she just knew. And there he was, with his rucksack on his back. 2020 and Cody walked with him. Tristy slapped her paws on the ground and ran to the back of the kennel. Cracker did the same. Then they ran back to the gate and set their best sit. Rick was almost here. Cracker began hopping in the kennel and pawing the gate. She was surprised when the other guys walked off in, the direct, in one direction and Rick killed her in a different one. She and Tristy looked back at each other before walking off with their guys. Rick seemed nervous, so she felt a little nervous too. She looked up at him and they walked to the helicopter pad and climbed onto the chopper. Even though nobody else was on board, Rick looked around anxiously. So Cracker looked around too, but didn't see anything unusual. All Rick knew was that they were headed for Benoit and that the mission involved special forces. Special forces did a lot of secret stuff. Nobody would say exactly what that meant. The special forces were basically the roughest, toughest, fastest, smartest, best trained American soldiers in Vietnam. They were like guys with engineering degrees and black belts at the same time. Super specialists. In short, nothing like Rick. Rick had actually heard they ate the soles of their feet when they were starving. That couldn't possibly be true, Rick assured himself. Could it? Cracker went to lie in the doorway next to Rick. She loved the windy choppers. Wind was her favorite thing. But then so were hot dogs. She wished Rick had a hot dog, but if he did, she would be able to smell it. She glanced at him, but he didn't even glance back. He was frowning. When the helicopter landed, Rick and Cracker hopped off. Ben Hua was huge compared to his little camp. He saw another handler with a dog and called out, Hey, I'm with the 67th IPSD. I'm supposed to go to Special Forces Headquarters. The other guy said, Hey, I hear you guys have some good dogs. He pointed, Special Forces is that way. Thanks, Rick said. He was barely in the building before a man stopped him and said, Rick Hansky? Then before Rick could answer, the man said, I'll go get the camel. Rick wondered who or what the camel was. He waited with Cracker. He was so nervous. He couldn't tell if he really had to take a leak or if he only thought he had to take a leak. After about 20 minutes, a man walked in and straight up to him, holding out his hand for a firm shake. I'm Camel. I'll be leading our mission. Camel was broad and didn't look even slightly like a camel. Maybe he smoked them. Camel wore, wore plain OD fatigues. No stripes, no dog tags, no distinguishing marks at all. Everything in the army was OD olive drab. A scarf was tied around his neck and his hands were heavily veined. He reminded Rick of a kid a few years older than him who lived on the, his block. The kid got in trouble a lot, especially at school, but then he'd gone on to become a cop. Rick remembered something his dad had told him once about being a cop. It's a thin line. It takes a bad boy to stop the bad boys. The best cops are bad guys who want to do good. Dad the philosopher. It was weird though, that line, as thin as a hair, yet it still made all the difference in the world. Cracker felt alert in all of her muscles and her nose and ears and even all the hairs on her body. This man who shook Rick's hand was strong. She could tell, though she figured she could take him if it came to that. She couldn't tell from Rick's response whether this man was Rick's friend or enemy. This is Cracker, the man said. Yes, sir. Beautiful animal. May I pet her? Of course, sir. You don't have to call me sir, Camel softly petted Cracker's head. Magnificent. Yes, sir. She sniffed out a sniper one day. Another day we saw a little action. You can call me Camel. You know what I do? Yes, sir, Camel. You're special forces. You do stuff we don't know about. <laughs> That's a good description of it. Rick had to ask, so why me? Your reputation. Your sergeant said you're the best there is. My sergeant? You all had recommended him? Rick felt a, joke of, a jolt of pleasure and shock at the same time. Thank you, sir. I mean, Camel, sir. Even Rick couldn't help laughing at what an idiot he sounded like. Camel laughed as well. Camel caught his head toward the door, and Rick followed thinking there'd been a mistake. Could it really be you, Hall, who had recommended him? Camel offered a cigarette as they walked outside. Hi, Sky. Rick reached for his lighter, but Camel had paused and was already holding out his. They walked quietly for a bit and then stood under the gray skies, smoking. Rick felt like a new kid at school who'd just befriend, been befriended by the star of the football team. Camel squinted toward where the sun would be. We're going to fly to Tainin. 
to practice for special missions with your dog. What's the mission, Rick asked. Rick waited. A split second passed. You couldn't even have noticed under normal conditions, but Rick could tell Camel was formulating a response instead of speaking spontaneously. We're executing a rescue. I'm still finalizing the plan. You get to make up the plan? Oh, yes. I'm special forces. And in special forces, you get the assignment, and then you have to put together the plan. Rick couldn't help exclaiming, cool, we just follow orders. He waited for more, but Camel didn't say anything. Two men were walking toward them. When the men arrived, one immediately put out a hand. Volkovich, he said, you must be Rick and Cracker. Like Camel, the two men wore nothing on their OD fatigues to indicate rank or affiliation. The other man stuck out his hand. You can call me Madman. Madman spoke so softly, Rick needed to strain to hear him. Madman? Rick hesitated nearly imperceptibly before reaching out his hand and saying, Nice to meet you, Madman. There was a silence, and Rick got the funny feeling that the other three were evaluating him. He tried to stand taller, add an inch or two to his stature. Then Camel slapped his sh shoulder. Let's get going. We got a long day of practice today. We're going to be rescuing some POWs. They're okay, just a few bruises, a little malnutrition, but no broken bones. We're lucky. Rick felt his heart beat faster. Rescuing? From where, he wondered. Okay, you guys, POWs, I don't know if you remember this or not, stands for prisoners of war. So they're going to be doing something under the radar, in, you know, on the down low, sneaking in and taking back prisoners that have been captured, American servicemen that have been captured. They walked over to the helicopter pad. The chopper hadn't arrived yet. Madman gently knelt down next to Cracker. Rick said, easy girl, but it wasn't necessary. Cracker immediately liked this man. He understood her. She could tell. He rubbed her ear. Ooh, mmm. Maybe he could teach this new ear rubbing method to Rick. Mmm. Rick felt a stab of jealousy as Cracker seemed almost to be smiling. Madman stood up. Very nice dog. Camel said, Madman talks to the animals. I kid you not. He's got a master's in psychology, and I swear sometimes I think he understands every living thing. Madman actually blushed. Rick said, so you took, so you work with animals for special forces? Nah, said Madman. I'm a demolitions expert. Camel laughed, slapped Madman hard on the back. He blows things up, don't you, Madman? Madman just smiled. The chopper arrived, the noise preventing any further normal conversation. They all climbed aboard. Camel sure was a nice guy, and Rick had never thought much about special forces. But so far, they weren't what he expected. He'd assumed they'd act more superior, like they were better than him. At Tainin, they got off and approached the special forces compound, a fenced area within a large base. A sign said classified area. Rick hesitated before walking further. Camel? Yep. I'm just a grunt man. I don't have clearance. We've taken care of all that. Camel kept going, so Rick followed. It dawned on him that if he had, that if they had clearance for him, they probably knew everything about him. They must have checked him all out already, and he hadn't even known it was being done. Camel Madman Bulkovich stopped to talk to a couple of other guys. Hey, how'd it go? Camel asked one of them. The man shook on a with a took on a peculiar expression. Uh, we found him. Camel seemed to understand immediately. I'm sorry, he said. And then Rick got it. The man they were talking about had been found dead. Yeah, said the other man. Did you talk to his parents? Yeah, yeah, the other man looked away. Yeah, he said again. There was a long silence. Vukovic spoke first. We'd better get started. The other men walked on. Camel, Vukovic, and Madman all turned to Rick at the same time. The suddenness of their attention made Rick catch his breath. Then Camel smiled. Let's have ourselves a good time today. We're going to practice weapons firing, demolition, helicopter insert of the team, movement on the ground, helicopter extractions with Stabo rig, a lot of fun stuff. Special forces used the Stabo for extractions. It's a great harness, never lets me down. Cracker's going to love it. Rick had an overwhelming feeling. He wanted to do good. No, no, he wanted to do great. The other guys acted as if Rick were one of them. Two Montagnards also practiced with them. Montagnards were the indigenous people of Vietnam, like the American Indians, and they worked closely and loyally with the special forces, the yards, as Camel affectionately called them. 
knew the terrain intimately. So for the rest of the day, the six of them fired CAR-15s, a shortened version of the M16 Rick usually carried, and ran, crept, hid, and jumped. Crocker occasionally sniffed traps that had been set up to test her. Camel had had her move faster than she was used to, but she still caught every trap. They also attached a special forces harness Camel had talked about, the Stabos, to themselves and Cracker. And then they were lifted off into the sky as they hung beneath the chopper. Camel had been right. It was just about the most fun day Rick had ever experienced. As they worked, Rick thought he had never sweated so much in his life. Then at the end of the day, the other three were suddenly slapping Rick on the back and saying, good job. And they petted Cracker and said over and over, good dog. They had a celebratory air about them. And that's when Rick realized that they were not, they had not been one of them all day, but he was now. They ate in the mess hall together that night, not talking about much except sports and dogs and their gals, everything except this war. At Camel's insistence, Cracker lay at the mess hall, lay in the mess hall next to them. With Camel doing most of the talking, Rick and the other guys ate the way that All guys ate, basically shoveling food into their mouths in a way Rick's mother would call bad manners. Rick's mind flitted briefly to home and then back again. That's the whole point, Camel was saying to Rick. Six men and a dog, but we're like one creature. But then, all of a sudden, Rick wanted to know something. Say, Camel, yeah, what's the worst thing you've ever seen? Camel didn't answer at first. He slowly finished chewing. He swallowed, and then he finally said, you got to move on from that kind of stuff. That's the nature of the work, man. You move on from what haunts you. Otherwise, you become like Tommy. Who's Tommy? Camel paused again and said, lost his nerve, had to quit. There was a silence while they ate, and then Camel said, most gently, hey, I hear your sister went undergrad to MIT. Rick said, yeah, she's a brain. And then he thought about that. What, you guys know everything about me? Camel smiled. For some jobs. I got a higher clearance than the members of Congress. We got to know who we're dealing with. They ate quietly, and then the others looked quietly at Camel as if waiting. Camel seemed kind of pleased, but also displeased. We did good out there today, but we're going to have to cut the practice short. One day instead of two. We got some new intel, so we don't have time to waste. We got a safe house. We'll take take you two in the morning. He was talking to Rick. Safe house? It's just a house in a village, but it's guarded. We'll be fine. So we're starting tomorrow instead of the day after? Yeah. So I want you and Cracker to get a good night's rest. Rick's heart sped up. A good night's rest? When all of this was going on, later he lay on its cot, Cracker on top of his legs. My knees, girl, he said. But she didn't budge, and he didn't try to push her off. He let his mind wander instead. He hadn't goofed here in Vietnam, but he hadn't gone on a killer mission yet. And Cracker, she was the other factor. He didn't know because he hadn't asked it of her whether she was a generalist or a specialist. She'd done everything he'd asked, but now they were stepping up a level. Why him? He could think of two reasons. Bruno had just returned from a kick-butt mission two weeks in the field. Couldn't overwork the dogs or they weren't as effective. And Tristy had gotten orders yesterday. So now here he was, the generalist asked to step up to specialize. But man, he didn't know. He just didn't know. Did he have the hunger for this kind of stuff? It wasn't too late. He could go to Camel and tell him no. They'd find someone else, just lose a day, but who knows what could happen to those prisoners in a day. He became aware of one of his feet going to sleep and reached down to push Cracker away. Sometimes Cracker liked to stay right where she was even if he didn't, right where she was even if he didn't want her to. Now when he reached down and tried to push her off, she stubbornly folded her paws around him. Maybe if he scolded her she would move off of him but rick suddenly felt too tired even for that he crashed in mid-thought and woke with his knees aching from cracker's weight after breakfast camel said we'll go in two separate jeeps so the locals don't know what we're up to cracker will ride with madman she won't ride with anyone but me rick said confidently then he saw cracker seem to smile as madman petted her cracker looked from rick to madman She liked this madman fellow, but Rick was her guy. She sat in front of Rick finally, he said. Go with madman, Cracker. He's your friend. Madman picked up her leash. Cracker looked up at Rick. Good girl, go with madman. He gave her the stay gesture and took a few steps 
to stand next to Camel. Maman said, come, Crocker. She hesitated, looked again at Rick. He didn't know what to do, so he turned his back. When he turned back around, he saw her jumping into the Jeep with Madman, Volkovich, and one of the Montagnards. He watched the Jeep as it drove off. Crocker gazed at him anxiously. He, Camel, and the second Montagnard waited about half an hour before driving off to the safe house. As described, it was just a hut in a village with a few Montagnards and Special Forces guys around keeping watch. Rick was feeling pretty tired. Even his brain felt tired. Camel looked curiously at Rick. Feel good about going on this mission? Rick thought a moment. Yeah, yeah, good. Listen to your intuition. Rick blurted out, I'm a little nervous. Camel said, I wouldn't want to go with anyone who wasn't. Sit down. Let's talk. And there on the floor of that hut, Camel told Rick more mission details. All the other men listened, and Cracker snored lightly by their side. Camel smoked cigarette after cigarette as he went over the plan. We need to rescue four captured personnel before the NVA takes them up to Hanoi. If they go to Hanoi, we'll never get them. Camel inhaled and seemed to be waiting for comment from Rick. Rick concentrated on the new information. Right, you said rescue earlier, he said. But you didn't say front where from. A jail. More of a pig pen, really. We have coordinates and a picture of the jail from our agent. Rick was still back on rescue. He said, yeah, yeah. Six of us plus a dog will perform the whole infiltration into the target area. Oh, man. Rick was slowly getting the picture. And as Rick understood it, infiltration meant going into enemy-held territory with just six men. He raced. Camel asked sympathetically, did you get enough to eat this morning? Need any cigarettes or anything? No, I'm fine. Rick's mouth didn't move right. Uh, just so I understand, we're infiltrating enemy-held territory with just six men and a dog? Absolutely. Camel's face was still sympathetic. We'll get you and your dog out of here. Don't worry. We appreciate your help and we'll take good care of you. He lit a new cigarette from his old one. Our guys are being held in an enemy camp with five or six guards at all times. Booby traps everywhere. And Cracker's going to have a lot to keep her busy. He paused, but it's all going to work. Cracker had roused at, a sound, at the sound of her name. Madman said she can handle it. Camel's famous for his intuition. He smiled at Cracker and then slapped Camel's back. Camel said, absolutely she can. This was all going a little fast for Rick, and he thought, I ain't famous for my intuition. It didn't take much intuition to sell drill bits, but he took a deep breath trying to remember how calm his father always was. Rick was a Hansky. Hanskys didn't panic. Still, his heart pounded. Camel added modestly, everybody's got intuition. But you know, in our line of work, you start to develop it more. Cracker waited while the men smoked silently. This camel man was looking at her like he was studying her. She wondered if she was supposed to bite his nose off. She looked at Rick, but he seemed calm. She decided not to bite the man's nose off. The man leaned forward. She growled. Easy girl, snapped Rick. Easy. She stopped growling. Rick's mind raced right along with his heart. But how do you know for sure that the men are there? Our agent told us, Camel said. Viet Cong man. Credible source, though. He'd never give us bad intel. Rick felt his jaw drop, but he closed it immediately. He wondered how much he was showing the tumult inside of him. He just didn't see how they could base an entire mission off something Charlie said. He tried to calm down. It was just that he'd heard a thousand times that you can't trust anything the Viet Cong said. He couldn't help speaking, but tried to make it sound casual. What if he's a double agent and it's an ambush? Cracker was getting agitated. Rick knew that she was feeling what he was feeling. Camel laughed wryly. Oh, yes. We've been ambushed. Oh, yes. That has happened, he chuckled. But I survived to tell you about it. He pulled something out of his pocket and threw it to Cracker. Cracker sniffed at the item as it flew through the air. Food. She snatched it from into her mouth, and she decided she liked this new man. But there was something about him. He seemed almost like her. On the other hand, all Rick had to do was tell her and she would bite anybody's neck. Camel silently took a few deep drags, giving Rick a moment to settle down. After a few moments, optimism started to fill Rick. He offered, well, practice did go smooth. The plan seemed solid. It's a good plan, Camel said. Do things usually go as planned, Rick asked. His optimism drained as the other men all laughed. <laughs> Madman said, 
Remember that time we were surrounded by about 200 enemy troops and you got pinned down? The others laughed more. That'll be a great story to tell the grandkids, Camel said. Rick wanted to say that being around, surrounded by 200 enemy troops wasn't a story that he'd want to be telling anyone ever. But he remembered his sisters and his rapt attention as they listened to their grandfather tell about World War II and the Nazis. Hansky stayed calm. He didn't say more. There was another brief silence. Then Camel said, it's a real good plan. More silence. Madman petted Crocker as Camel continued. The thing about plans is that you can't predict what the enemy is going to do. You can only plan for what you think is going to happen. So when they put it, when we get out there, you have to try not to ask yourself whether you can, whether you can do something. Instead, you have to tell yourself, I will do this. Not can, but will. He paused, looked up at Rick. I hear you're a good shot. Yeah, I did pretty good at NAIT. Shooting well had come in pretty easy to Rick. A gun was like some kind of an ultimate tool. Madman nodded approval. But at Cracker, he murmured to her, six people and a dog, one creature. Cracker had no idea what he was saying, but he sure did know how to pet a dog. They planned to spend a short time practicing today, just like yesterday, but then as Rick was finishing off a mid-morning snack, Camel rushed in and said, new intel, got to move. Rick didn't move, and for the first time, Camel looked annoyed with him. Let's move! Rick had taken some things out of his sack and had to repack them. He was the last one out of the safe house. Like the other men, Rick was supposed to go on the mission sterile. That meant no inf- uniform, just plain fatigues. He taped his dog tags together and put them in his pocket. He took off Cracker's metal choke chain so it wouldn't rattle. He pulled Cracker's stabo harness out of his rucksack and found it all stuck together. He tried to figure th- that one out. Maybe it had gotten wet somehow and some of the adhesive from the tape had stuck to it. Nah. Maybe he was concentrating so hard he didn't notice Volkovich laughing. The other guys started laughing too. Camel laughed hardest. Don't worry. That's not a real harness. Volkovich is our glue expert. Rick wasn't sure if this was a joke. Maybe special forces had some kind of a special super glue. Everyone looked seriously at Rick for a second. We're kidding, Camel said. Oh, Rick said. Then he finally got it. Just like Every unit had a procurement specialist. It seemed like everyone had a practical joke specialist, too. In this group, that would be Volkovich. Rick finally laughed. But by then, nobody else was. They all walked toward the Huey in the nearby field. Rick noticed some of the locals watching them. Camel pointed at Volkovich and said, Hey, when you get off the chopper, don't forget your sack like you did last time. They both laughed. Rick was shocked at how casual the team seemed. Cracker had come to accept the others because now she could feel that Rick felt comfortable with them. When they reached the chopper, Cracker jumped aboard eagerly. They lifted into the sky. Cracker smelled smoke in the air. Busy day in Vietnam, shouted Camel. Rick's feet hung out the doorway. They seemed to be going west, and for a long while, he turned to Camel. If we keep going west, we're going to cross the border into Cambodia. That's right. It was illegal under the rules of engagement for the United States to cross the border. Of course, Camel would know that. He would also know that if they got taken prisoner across the border, there was nobody to save them except other special forces. He leaned into Camel's ear and shouted, The rules of engagement! Won't we get into trouble? Camel shouted back, The president knows all about this activity over the border. Rick was stunned. The president? Like the president of the United States? Would the president know that he, Rick Hansky, was going over the border?